and continuing in our service leaflet. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to your hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. be with you. you. Let us pray. Almighty God, the fountain of all wisdom, you know our necessities before we ask and our ignorance in asking. Have compassion on our weakness and mercifully give us those things which for our unworthiness we dare not and for our blindness we cannot ask. Through the worthiness of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. We will read 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 through 14a. When the king was settled in his house, and the Lord had given him a rest from all his enemies around him, the king said to the prophet Nathan, See now, I am living in a house of cedar, but the ark of God stays in a tent. Nathan said to the king, Go do all that you have in mind, for the Lord is with you. But that same night, the word of the Lord came to Nathan, Go tell my servant David, Thus says the Lord, Are you the one to build me a house to live in? I have not lived in the house since the day I brought up the people of Israel from Egypt to this day. But I have been moving around the tent, in a tent and a tabernacle. Whoever, where, wherever I have moved, about among all uh, all the people of Israel, did I ever speak a word with any of the tribal leaders of Israel, whom I command to the shepherd, my people of Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David, Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture, from following the sheep to be a prince over my people of Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went, and I have cut off all of your enemies from before you. And I will make for you a great name, like the names of the great ones of, on the, of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people, Israel, and I will plant them, so that they may live in their own place and be disturbed more, no more. And evildoers shall afflict them. No more, as formerly, 
from the from the time that I appointed judges over my people in Israel, and I will give the, and I will give you rest from all your enemies. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house when your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your ancestors. I will raise up your offspring after you. You shall come forth from your own, from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be a father to him, and shall be, and he shall be a son to me. The word of the Lord. Be to God. We read Psalm chapter eighty-nine, verses twenty through thirty-seven. We will read in unison. I have found David, my servant. With the holy oil I have anointed him. My hand will hold him fast, and my arm will make him strong. No enemy shall deceive him, nor any wicked man bring him down. I will crush his foes before him, as I pronounce who hate him. My faithfulness and love shall be with him, and he shall be victorious through my name. I shall make his dominion extend from the great sea to the river. He will say to me, you are my father, my God, and the rock of my salvation. I will make him my firstborn and higher than the kings of the earth. I will keep my love for him forever and my covenant will stand firm for him. I will establish his lines forever and his throne of the days of heaven. If his child forsake my law, and do not walk according to my judgments. If they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, I will punish their transgressions with a rod and their iniquities will lash. But I will not take my love from them, nor let my faithfulness prove false. I will not break my covenant, nor change what has gone out of my lips. Once for all, I have sworn by my, my holiness I will not lie to David. His line shall endure forever, and his throne as before them before me. And it shall be stand fast forevermore, like the moon, the abiding witness in the sky. Our second lesson is from Ephesians chapter 2, verses 11 through 22. Remember that at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision, a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh, he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall, that is, the hostility between us. He has abolished the law with its commandments and ordinances, that he might create in himself one new humanity in place of the two, thus making peace and might reconcile both groups to God in one body through the cross, thus putting to death that hostility through it. So he came and proclaimed peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. For through him, both of us have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are citizens with the saints and also members of the household of God, built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also built together spiritually into a dwelling place for God. The word of the Lord. Please stand as you're able and join us in singing our sequence hymn, Blessed Assurance, panel found on page four of your music supplement.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. The apostles gathered around Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. He said to them, Come away to a deserted place all by yourselves and rest a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in the boat to a deserted place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they hurried there on foot from all the towns and arrived ahead of them. As he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. When they had crossed over, they came to land of Genesee and moored the boat. When they got out of the boat, people at once recognized him and rushed about the whole region and began to bring the sick on mats to wherever they heard he was. And wherever he went into villages or cities or farms, they laid the sick in the marketplaces and begged him that they might touch even the fringe of his cloak, and all who touched it were healed. The Gospel of our Lord. I preach to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Who doesn't love a good stereotype? Nobody? Nobody likes a good stereotype? Stereotypes are these kind of observational humor that can be really funny sometimes. Uh, one time in particular when I was living in the peach state of Georgia, I was walking to a coffee shop uh, near the church where I was working with uh, one of my brothers and colleagues and it was the fall season. And uh, you know with fall comes pumpkin spice lattes and my friend when we got to the coffee shop asked me was I going to try a pumpkin spice latte and I said no I'm not gonna try no pumpkin spice latte I'm black and of course the punchline of the joke is this assumption that black people have made their choice made their choice about the root vegetable that they eat during that season and it is not pumpkin it's sweet potato i said now if they come up with a sweet potato latte maybe you maybe you have me but pumpkin spice no it just evokes images of 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 leggings and man buns and it's just not for me and so my Dear wonderful good friend who is uh, vanilla, that's my cold word for white. Uh, no offense to my vanilla sisters and brothers in the room today. Uh, he says uh, he was just, all of his flabbers were gassed. He could not believe that someone would be making, uh, someone such as myself would be making such a generalization. So the barista at the coffee shop also happened to be black. And so he asked the barista for a second opinion. Is it true that your people eat 
or only uh, you, you don't like pumpkin? And the barista, who is black, says, oh, I don't get into all of that. People should be able to eat what they want to eat. Me, personally, I love pumpkin. I think pumpkin, pumpkin pie is beautiful and delicious. Me and my wife, when we get together, we always have pumpkin pie during the fall. I said, you and your wife, huh? You, you and your wife have pumpkin pie? I said, your, your wife, she white, ain't she? That's not the point. I said, my point exactly. Stereotypes. They can be funny based on observations, but when stereotypes get used in a way that builds barriers instead of bridges, when stereotypes embody things that divide us and they are used against a person or a people group, then we know that instead of a bridge, a barrier has been put up. A wall has been put up. Speaking of walls, we know about the Wailing Wall in Jerusalem, this retaining wall on the Temple Mount that for several reasons, some religious and some political, it's the only place where devout Jews can pray on the temple compound. They can't get any closer to the holies of holies. And some of us have been there uh, and, and have seen this wall. Thousands of Jews praying, stuffing prayers into the cracks of the walls because this is as close as they can get to one of the holiest places in their religion. That retaining wall that was meant to support the wider structure has been turned into a barrier that keeps people out, that keeps people away. Detroit has a wailing wall. It is called the wailing wall or the eight mile wall or the Burwood Wall. This wall that was installed in 1941, not far from here, so that a developer could secure loans for a housing development, and in a process that we now call redlining, we understand that this wall was built to keep black folks on the east side of the wall and white folks on the west side of the wall. This half mile stretch of alley between Burwood and Mendota, between Eight Mile and Pembroke, again, not far from where we are right now. There is a stone barrier that was erected solely for the purpose of keeping people apart. Now the thing is it didn't work because now both sides of the wall are black communities and that barrier has now become somebody else's backyard fence with a mural designing it. The thing that was meant to keep people divided has actually brought people together. I want you to hear again the words from Ephesians chapter 2. Remember then at one time you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcision by those who are called the circumcision a physical circumcision made in the flesh by human hands. Remember that you were at that time without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenant of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace. In his flesh he has made both groups into one and has broken down the dividing wall that is the hostility between us. I stand this morning, this afternoon rather, to remind us, to remind us that Arguing for social justice and unity is not a political issue. 
It is a kingdom issue. Let me say that again. Arguing and championing for equal rights and for equal access and for equal opportunities is not a political issue. I don't care what the candidate on the other side has to say. Either side, I'm not telling you anything that you don't know. These are not political issues. They are kingdom issues that in fact, over 2,000 years ago, God already made his decision about the subject when Jesus Christ died on the cross to atone for the sins of all. Paul says to the Ephesians, the wall that kept people alienated not only from God, but from each other has been divided and that the two groups have been made one. Christ has set us free from the pressures of alienation, from the pressures that would keep us divided. And if we do live in the feeling of isolation or in the mode of alienation, it is not because God has willed it, because God has already told us his decision on the matter, but rather because we choose to continue to live in isolation. We choose to set up camps with the pumpkin spice latte people and the sweet potato pie people. That is a choice that we make. So let me give you some history and background so you understand more of what Paul is trying to do. In the middle of the first century, Jews lived in various places, all controlled by the Roman Empire. And Ephesus was one of the largest port cities in Asia Minor. It had a booming early Christian community that were comprised of Jews who had began to recognize that Jesus of Nazareth was their long-promised Messiah and Gentiles who were persuaded by the testimony of Jews or by divine revelation that Jesus, not the emperor, not Diana, not Artemis, was the one true and living God in human flesh. And though these Gentiles and Jews shared a common hope and shared a common faith in Jesus, when they got together, though, they seemed only to be able to perpetuate the biases and the stereotypes that each group had about the other. Paul is writing to the Ephesians to remind them that those attitudes, those biases, those prejudices have no place at the common table. Paul says, that's who you used to be. That's how you used to think. That's how you used to act. We no longer make moral judgments about people based on whether or not they like pumpkins or sweet potatoes. The dividing wall has been demolished. Verses 11 through 13 in our reading from Ephesians, Paul is telling the Gentile audience, like, listen, I want you to go back in time and I want to be very, very clear. I want you to remember how bad life used to be. You were aliens from the state of Israel. Not the country, but the eternal spiritual Israel. They were on the outside looking in. It was as the urban street prof, uh, a poet Chris Brown says, how you hating from outside the club when you can't even get in. I say that for my young folks so they know I'm hip. They were on the outside looking in to all of the covenant, all of the wonderful things that God had given the children of Israel there from the outside, looking in, licking their chops, kind of like how we do while we smell the food cooking. Outside, 
He said they were godless, without hope in the world. They were lost. They were, as the comedian Martin says, toe up from the flow up. That's another millennial reference, you know, you know, people who watch TV back in the 90s. Toe up from the flow up. They were messed up. But what God does in Jesus is he offers them faith, he offers them hope, he offers them a new life. And because of the faith that they share with those Jesus Jews, they are in the same family, they are in the same group. They now have a share right alongside the covenant people of Israel. God has acted in Jesus not to save two separate nations, but to make one. God has acted in a way that brings the sweet potato people and the pumpkin people together as one. In verses 14 through 18, Paul writes that in Christ there is peace. And I know that sometimes when we think of the word peace, we may think of mountain view vistas and serene lakes or Bob Ross painting. You know, that's, that's a shout out for my PBS watchers, for my older adults. Remember Bob Ross? You may think of, thank you, he was awesome. You may think of those serene pictures that he would paint. But in the first century, in Paul's day, talk of peace was political speech. Talk of peace was enough to get you in trouble with the state. Because the Roman Empire cared very much about peace. They thought that they had brought peace to the Greeks. And what Paul is saying, no, the reason why we have peace is Jesus. The goddess Artemis, whose huge temple was in Ephesus, People would come from all over Asia Minor and all over the Roman Empire to visit the temple of Artemis, the goddess of the hunt. Jesus says, or Paul says rather, that Artemis is not responsible for the peace. The protectorate of the city, Artemis is not responsible for that. Jesus is. Jesus is our peace. And that peace is specifically the end of hostilities between people. Not just people, but with God. Paul means that the alienation and the estrangement between God and humans is gone. And now the alienation and dividing wall between humans and humans is gone as well. The emperor could not bring peace. Artemis could not bring peace. Only Jesus. And to make this point, he makes a reference to that temple in Jerusalem. We heard the first lesson about the first temple uh, uh, that Solomon would build. It was destroyed. And several years later, several years later, several hundreds of years later, Herod rebuilt the temple bigger than it ever was was and at this temple everything was sectioned off with stone to keep people away from God or God away from them we're not sure and definitely to keep Gentiles or to keep non-Jews away from the Jews a barrier wall just like the one on 8 Mile in Mendota there was this court of the Gentiles. This was the only place where non-Jews could congregate and conduct business on the Temple Mount. And it was the only place that Jews could hang out with Gentiles, although we're not really sure why. History suggests that there was a lot more coming together between the two groups, but you know how it is. People like the salacious stories of prejudice and bias. But there were elements of both groups getting together. And what happened was, is this cordoned off area with stone, the closer that one got to the temple, there was a wall there that stood about five feet, two inches tall, so about as tall as me, with warnings etched in stone 
both written in Hebrew and in Greek, a warning that said, if you were not Jewish, not to cross this wall, not to cross this dividing barrier at the risk of death. The temple police would have permission to kill anyone who was not Jewish that crossed that barrier. Paul uses this as a reference to make his point that that dividing wall that kept Jews and non-Jews separated from each other, Christ demolished that wall stone by stone, namely by the violence that was wreaked upon his own body, that for every whip, for every lash, for every time he was spat upon, for every time that nail was hammered into his body as he hung on that cross for hours and hours, as he gave up the ghost, his sacrifice was taking out each stone in that dividing wall so that there would be no wall, that there would be no separation. As a matter of fact, the Gospels recall that when Jesus gave up the ghost and breathed his last, that the earth quaked and the veil in the temple was rent in two. No more separation, no more walls, no more for colored only signs, no more for white only signs. There is one people, there is one God, there is one hope, there is one faith, there is one baptism, and Jesus made it all possible that Jesus has already shown us the heart of God that he wants people together and he wanted it so much that he was willing to die to secure it and so again my sisters and brothers if we are alienated from each other we ought not dare attach God's name to our prejudices and our biases when God has come. As Bishop Curry is so, uh, quotes so often the battle hymn of the Republic, he quotes that line that says, Christ died to make men holy. Let us live to make men free. We have a choice to make. Verses 19 through 22, don't worry, I'm just talking alone and giving time to cook. Paul takes the metaphor even further by suggesting that not only has Christ broken down the wall by, ending, by enduring punishment and death, but that the risen Lord has assembled all of those who trust in him for salvation in the same way a master builder assembles stones. That what God builds out of people is one household and one temple with all of these people from different walks of life. Again, God takes our disparate differences from one another and like a master builder, ah, this is perfect. I got an illustrated sermon right here. All of these different stones with different colors, with different shapes, with different sizes of different materials have all been brought together for one purpose, for beauty, for structure. That's what God does for each one of us. See, you don't have to worry about if you're going to fit in or if somebody's going to like me or if you laugh too loud or if you laugh too quiet. God has a place for each and every one of us. You do not have to be somebody else because God has a you shaped spot in the wall that he is building, the household that he is building, the temple that he is building. You see, folks were coming to Ephesus to go to a temple, and what Paul is telling the Ephesians is that rather what God has done is made you into a temple. People are coming to see the temple of Artemis, but what the world really needs to do is they need to travel to Ephesus to see you, to see how people who were born on different sides of the track, born with different identities, born with different loyalties, born with different personalities, how God has worked together to bring them together. 
That's the power of the gospel. That there is unity and there is peace in Christ. So how do I bring it home? First, I want to remind you about the alienation. We're not dismissing alienation. Alienation is real, but it does not have to be. Number one, if you are sitting here today or watching here today and you feel disconnected from God or scared to come to church because you're scared you might get struck down with lightning or I just need to get my life together before you come to church, that doesn't make any sense. Don't stay away from God because the dividing wall has been torn down. There was nothing to keep God away from you and there was nothing to keep you away from God. Come home. Come home to God. Or you might be saying, well, I feel cut off from people in my life. That's a choice. Now, mind you, some distance is healthy, right? We're not saying everybody open up the doors of your house and sing Kumbaya with everybody. But what I am saying is that there are people in our lives that we should be making room for. If everybody in your circle thinks like you, talks like you, walks like you, acts like you, likes what you like, you may be living in a tunnel with confirmation bias. And you think that confirmation bias is the state of the whole world. Because you like sweet potatoes, you think everybody likes sweet potatoes. And if you don't like sweet potatoes, something is wrong. Expand yourself. Don't use that to keep yourself alienated or isolated from anybody else. And point number two about the hostility. The only hostility that we should be having toward one another it, it, or, or, or have in our life is actually hostility that should be directed toward the walls and the systems that keep putting walls up against people, that keeps pulling people apart. If we are so engrossed and fighting ourselves, and let me hear you, I, let me be clear, I'm not talking about sinners and non-sinners. I'm talking about Christians and Christians. If we are so busy fighting with folks about what day you should go to worship and whether or not you should believe in the Ten Commandments or whether or not you should have communion without being baptized or whether or not you should ordain women or whether or not you should accept a uh, uh, welcome the LGBTQ community or not even that. How about black and black, dark skin versus light skin or how about black conservatives versus black liberals or how about they are too young and inexperienced versus those who are too old and sometimes in the way. If we keep fighting one another, the only person who's having a good day is the devil. Because while we are fighting one another, the devil is getting the victory and winning in our homes and in our communities and in our cities and in our schools. Let's stop fighting one another. And say, hey, we don't have to agree on everything, but what we can agree on is that this wall is a problem. Let's tear it down. Now, you can go back to your place, and I can go back to mine, but let's fight and work together. Maybe we may find out that, you know what, pumpkin is not that bad. You know, a little, little cinnamon on that, a little whipped cream. This is palatable. This is all right. You may discover that sweet potato is pretty good. Give people the benefit of the doubt. That's how you do it. Don't assume that just because you see what someone drives or where they live <laughs> or they make a political post that you know them. You know something about them, but you may not know them. Give people the benefit of the doubt. How many of you have been in conversations where the, the only reason why you're talking is so that the other person can argue with you? And you're listening not to get to know them, you're listening to react. You're listening to respond. This is a challenge for us. This is a choice for us. I am going to start taking the time to get to know the person that I don't like or the person who has a different viewpoint from me because we may have... We may have different views, but our values may be aligned. Let's see what we can do to work together. And here's the last thing. 
in the creed, we're going to say that we believe, we trust in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church that where Catholic means universal. Understanding that there is one church and that we, that, 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 um, that our experience of Christianity is more than just all saints Episcopal church. We have brothers and sisters of the same denomination just a few miles up the road with whom we can praise and pray and play. And biases and prejudices about one church being uppity or another church being too high or whatever heard story you heard about those people over there, let it go. Because there was so much more that we can accomplish if we can just get together. You want to know how to apply that? When we intentionally plan things between congregations, show up. Because there's only one church, there's only one faith, there's only one Lord, there's only one baptism, and frankly, there's only one priest, and y'all not going to kill me. Let's get together when we can. Let's explore one another. Let's enjoy one another. Let's enjoy all of the difference that Christ has created. Everyone in here has probably felt alienated from God or someone else at one point in time. I am telling you that you do not need to feel, you do not have to feel that way. Christ has broken down the wall. You can be loved and you can love. You can accept and you can be accepting and you can be accepted. I am telling you that the start of the place of equality begins here that we are all equally sinners saved by grace, and we move on from there. The blood of Jesus has brought those who are far off near. And as we gather around this table, we are reminded the price of that unity. It was not cheap. It cost Jesus his own life. He gave his life so that all of us could sit around this table with this one bread and this one cup. And I'm going to say this line because it's funny, but I forgot that we was going to be at the picnic today. We are all the same height when we're kneeling. Come to this table for renewal and strength. Come to the water to be washed of any impurities that keep you from the love of God and from the love of self. Find the places in your hearts and in your social circles where there are walls and see what you can do to turn them into backyard fences at your work with your children and your grandchildren or even down at your social club. Those barriers can be backyard walls. What are you going to choose to do? Amen. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things are made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. 
We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people. In Jesus' name, we offer our prayers to God, who was and is and is to come, saying, Lord, hear our prayer. For a world filled with computers and playgrounds, art museums and mud huts, jet planes and ox carts, green fields and barren deserts, we beg for your mercy. For a world filled with the sophisticated and the simple, the fruitful and the withered, the whole and the maimed, we beg for your mercy. And for the joy that, or for that joy, comes from respecting how each contributes to the whole. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For the church filled with teachers and dock workers, the disabled and the unemployed, the dying and the infants, the homemakers and artists, we beg for your mercy. And for a church filled with the sophisticated and the simple, the fruitful and the withered, the whole and the maimed, we beg for your mercy. For the hope that comes from respecting how each contributes to the whole, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, hear our prayer. For people whose lives are filled with anxiety and despair, happiness and health, pain and trouble, wonder and challenge, honest or bitter isolation, we beg for your mercy. For human lives filled with the sophisticated and the simple, the fruitful and the withered, the whole and the main, we beg for your mercy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. For, all in, in, for all in any need, especially Arnie, Bianca, Calmeter, Catherine G, Charles, Crystal, Daryl, David, Ian, Delano, Melinda, Emmett, Leonard, Antonio, Eleanor, James B, Janice, Jamie, Joseph, Lucy, Jamar, Kent, Ruby, Kat, Lena, Armor, Missy, Lucia, Majid, Arkansas, Marilyn, Martha, Muriel, Nicole, Oscar, Patrick G, Tony G, Robert W, Rosalind, Ruby, Sean, Tila A, Valerie, Vicky, and Walter. Let us pray to the Lord. We are here to pray. For the peace that comes from respecting how each contributes to the whole, let us pray to the Lord. That be that we be one in faith with all who have died in Christ. For our life is hid with Christ and God. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord hear our prayer. Please offer your own intercessions at this time. From Michael, our presiding bishop, Bonnie, our bishop, Moises, Bishop of the Dominican Republic. Elizabeth, Donald, and Craig, bishops in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, Grace Church, Detroit, St. Mary's in the Hills, Lake Orion, St. Mary the Virgin, Mon Montalano, Dominican Republic, and for all the clergy and people, let us pray to the Lord. For those celebrating birthdays, especially Marcia E., Mary, Deacon Mike, Naomi, and Jason W., let us pray to the Lord. <laughs> Fill us, almighty God, with joy, hope, and peace. Grant that hostilities may cease, strangers become friends, and all humanity discover the world as your household. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who reigns in unity with you and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent for the sake of your son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. 
Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. God's peace, peace, peace. Amen, my friends. Please be seated. Uh, we want to thank everyone for being here today and those who are watching online. We're going to continue our service with Holy Communion and all who claim the faith of Jesus, who share with us in baptism, those who are indeed one people in faith in Christ are invited to come forward to this table to receive the evidence of our unity, which is the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ and bread and wine. While we are preparing the table, are we passing off from plates? <laughs> so the plate will be making its way around. It's so uh, if, if you feel called and led uh, to share some of what you have for the good of this ministry and for the good of this church so that we may in turn continue to do good for others, uh, please give uh, generously. For those who are watching, online you too can be a part of the giving by going to our website at allsaintsdetroit.org clicking on the giving tab and uh, and that's even for those of you who here who want to give electronically you can do that right from our website at allsaintsdetroit.org um, I've already talked about communion but uh, as a reminder uh, I will place the bread in your hand you may either consume it and then take the chalice or you may uh, hold the bread in your hand and the Eucharistic minister will intinct it for you and give it back to you. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave him so for us an offering and sacrifice to God. Oh, our communion offertory hymn is in your bulletin. Uh, just a closer walk with thee.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God of all power, ruler of the universe, you are worthy of glory and praise. At your command, all things came to be. The vast expanse of interstellar space, galaxies, suns, the planets and their courses, and this fragile earth, our island home. From the primal elements, you brought forth the human race and blessed us with memory, reason, and skill. You made us the rulers of creation, but we turned against you and betrayed your trust, and we turned against one another. Again and again, you called us to return. Through prophets and sages, you revealed your righteous law, and in the fullness of time, you sent your only son, born of a woman, to fulfill your law, to open for us the way of freedom and peace. And therefore, we praise you, joining with the heavenly chorus, with prophets, apostles, and martyrs, and with all those in every generation who have looked to you in hope, to proclaim with them your glory in their unending hymn. So, Father, we who have been redeemed by him and made a new people by water and the Spirit, now bring before you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be the body and blood of Jesus Christ, our Lord. On the night he was betrayed, he took bread, said the blessing, broke the bread, gave it to his friends and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, gave thanks, and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Remembering now his work of redemption and offering to you this sacrifice of thanksgiving, we celebrate his death and resurrection as we await the day of his coming. Lord God of our fathers, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, open our eyes to see your hand at work in the world about us. Deliver us from the presumption of coming to this table for solace only and not for strength, for pardon only and not for renewal. Let the grace of this Holy Communion make us one body, one spirit in Christ, that we may worthily serve the world in his name. Risen Lord be known to us in the breaking of the bread. Accept these prayers and praises, Father, through Jesus Christ, our great high priest, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit, your church gives honor, glory, and worship from generation to generation. Amen. And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say,
one. It was 37. I got 23. I got 12. 23 is 35. 36. 37. Okay. So let's just. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food and the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. We have some announcements and a word of welcome. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. I am Vestry member Allison Phillips. For those who don't know me, welcome to all of you that are here at the picnic and those viewing from abroad on Zoom, Facebook, or whatever other medium. Just have a few announcements here. And what I would like to do is just have us all recite our mission statement, which is found on page 16 of our bulletins here. At All Saints, we are answering the call to be committed stewards of Christ's ministry by strengthening our faith, serving the community, and spreading his love by thought, word, and deed. Thank you. Hope that we can always keep that close to our hearts and as we go forth and out into the world and fellowship with others. So, let's see. I want to mention here that Reverend Estes will be on vacation from July 27th through August 4th. Any concerns that you may have regarding pastoral needs, please contact Deacon Mike and his information, contact information is in the bulletin here. I want you to still be safe and well hydrated this summer, so please be mindful of the instructions in the insert, which will help you uh, navigate the warm weather, extremely warm weather that we're having. The ECW meetings are paused through July and August and will resume in September. A memorial service for our former sexton, Edward Granderson, will be held on Saturday, August 17th at 1 at All Saints. So hopefully all can be in attendance. Hospitality hour is also paused through July and August. And however, there will be bottled water provided in the chapel. Um, most, well not most importantly, but important is that All Saints will be a voting site on August 6th. So volunteers are welcomed and requested for that day between the hours of 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. You don't have to be here all day, but if you can give just a few hours or a block of time, it would be much appreciated. If you can do so, please contact the church with the time that you will be available or if you have any questions. Um, the rest of the announcements seem to be pretty routine. I invite you to read them at your leisure, but to point out that on July 24th, there is going to be a midweek Eucharist. So that is all. Any other announcements? Okay. Oh, Mrs. Gamble has one. This is one. This is shelter one that went to the pre the where where we were last year. Okay, so yes, we have a announcement. I will just repeat it. Apologies to any of our guests who went to our previous location for the picnic instead of shelter one here. I will admit I drove over there myself because the city may need to do a better job of putting out the numbers and the names of the shelters out on the road rather than right when you get up to it. So apologies, but I'm glad that everybody made it. We're here now together and we'll enjoy the rest of the service. So I turn it over to you, Reverend Esther. Amen. Well, I know there are a couple of birthdays in here and we don't have our prayer book. So I'm just going to say a general birthday blessing um, for because we know that that's such um, a cherished tradition here at All Saints, right? We don't have, okay, all right. And so, um, um, is July 24th this coming Thursday? 
Okay, I am, uh, we're going to cancel that Eucharist on July 24th. July 24th, there is no Eucharist on July 24th. Sorry, I forgot to get that in. Okay, all right, uh, I'm trying to turn to the page with the birthdays on it. Uh, oh, it's in the prayers of the people. Mike, I know you on here. Yeah, come on, Mike, since you uh, called me out the other week. Come on up here, brother. Anybody else with birthdays? Birthdays this week. Joanna was last week. Joanna was last week. Okay, all right. All right, so I'm just going to say it, but, but Mike, got to, he got to stand here because, you know, payback. All right, <laughs> let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks and praise for all of those whom you have allowed to see another year of life. We pray that they continue to grow in grace and wisdom, that whatever the, it is that they set their hands to do, that you would bless them and give them sweet success. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Okay. I'm going to uh, bless the food, give a blessing, and we're going to sing our hymn. Michael dismiss us, and then my part is over. Bless our Lord these gifts to our use and us your service. Keep us mindful for the needs of others. Thank you for all who have donated uh, time and effort to bring the food, to cook the food, to get the food here for all of those who have brought dishes from home. Thank you for each and every one of them. And Father, whether it is sweet potatoes or, or pumpkin on the table, we thank you for it all. And we pray that this fellowship uh, would edify us and this food would fortify us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. The peace of God, which passes all knowledge and understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of Jesus' his Son. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you always. Amen. Please stand as you're able and join us in singing our closing hymn, hymn number 194. Well, it's in your leaflet, the last one, Lead Me, Guide Me.
Sir. 